Hi, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can do both. Okay, are we live or are we <laughs> yes. just recording you and me? No, we are We are finally live. Uh, we'll do it live. Figured it out. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna share a post on Facebook so that everybody can, um, can join us. Find us. Yes, and then if you'll pop me that link, I'll share it on mine too. Okay, cool. Um, let me do that right now. Next time we should do a test run before. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not fun. <laughs> uh, okay, one sec. Uh, Awesome. Got it. Sweet. I'm going to go post it right now. So I'm sure it's not as cold as it is here um, for your winter, but <laughs> this morning it was minus 31 degrees Celsius. That's cold. I was trying to figure out here what it's probably in the 60s. Yeah, I know. What is that in Fahrenheit? We, it's like we speak two different languages. I know. <laughs> minus 31 is minus 23 Fahrenheit. Brrr. Yeah. Mm. Super cold. Sweet. So I, I shared it on um, my page, and I guess you're just sharing it on yours. Yes. Some really good, really great questions from um, the kombucha curious people on uh, on Facebook, and I mean, th there's always like this. The I would say there's like two or three questions that I see all the time on forums when it comes to um, kombucha and, and questions that people people have about making their own kombucha, and then there's also a few that kind of showed up that I haven't seen before that are that are pretty interesting, and also um, I think take into account like the live factor that kombucha is because I think when people start making their own food, their own drinks, um, it's a lot different when you're dealing with a, um, a live organism when you're fermenting and creating, um, drinks with live organisms, because when, when things are not alive then it's easy to manipulate them and that sort of thing. So I can't wait to uh, kind of jump into some of these questions today. And then, I mean, when you think of diving into the questions, there's definitely going to be a deep dive happening at the end of January um, from the 24th to 27th, the virtual kombucha conference. So we're just going to be kind of touching on the, the tip of the iceberg of our uh, kombucha journey. And if people really want to dive into tea and Scobia's fabric and perfecting your kombucha brew and scaling into a kombucha business, then um, I would hop over to the virtual kombucha conference dot com to um to register right away so did you want to show us anything or did you want to just jump into some questions that we got from facebook i have this lovely glass of love potion kombucha here in my um kbi glass our sample glass that you get every year at the conference it had a scoby and a yeast glob <laughs> it's <was> delicious <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm ready to dive into questions. Let's see what people want to know and uh, what we can answer for them today. And then hopefully they'll join us for, like you said, even more details at the virtual kombucha conference coming up in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Well, I, I think a good place to start is just the fact that when you're drinking kombucha, some people get a little bit afraid, especially if it's their first or their second time drinking kombucha. They don't make their own, but maybe they go to the grocery store or health food store decide to buy a bottle of kombucha because they've heard about it from one of their their friends or family members or maybe on Facebook somewhere and they get a bottle and they pour it out and all of a sudden this little piece pops out, this little mini disc that, that comes out and kind of people jump back, but obviously you're really embracing it. Um, what's what's with that? Why, is that? why does that happen in the, the kombucha jars? 
Well, so anytime that there is oxygen available in the bottle, right? Like when you buy a bottle from the store, it says 12 ounces, 16 ounces, whatever it is. But that bottle capacity is actually larger than that. And this is why you don't typically find that your bottles are filled all the way to the top. But there's a little bit of airspace. And that airspace has just enough oxygen that your kombucha will potentially continue to ferment in the bottle. And that's what creates those really yummy um, little, <laughs> for lack of a, for, as a less desirable term, snot globs. But I like to think of them more as oyster shooters. And so um, they just are the beginnings of a new SCOBY forming, which is definitely a sign of a robust, healthy kombucha something that you want to buy and some people will strain those out because they just find the texture to be unappealing and I do remember the first time one ever graced my lips it was a spit take in the store because I was not ready uh, instinctually my body was like whoa what's trying to get into my mouth and I wasn't expecting that however I've come to embrace the um the, the globs and the bits and the, the bobs that sort of form in the bottles as they continue to ferment and just really, they have additional nutrition. But the reality is you don't have to drink it every time. You can filter it out. You can toss it back, whatever you're comfortable with. But you will get a little extra boost of nutrition if you decide to allow the bacteria to onboard. <laughs> Um, so you talked about drinking um, kombucha. What I see a lot is um, people curious about how much should they drink? Is there a threshold in terms of too much kombucha? Should I be drinking five bottles of kombucha? Should I be drinking one a week? Um, is there really any doctor's prescription in terms of how much kombucha should you be drinking? And the other part is if I'm a, um, I'm visiting my my cousin or my my brother who has a, a five-year-old nephew and I want to share kombucha with them, is kombucha safe for, for children? I think the easiest way is to sort of reframe how we think of kombucha. I know it has this wonderful um, history of being called the, you know, mushroom of long life, the tea of immortality. And I think that these names are given because people really feel a great uh, benefit when they consume kombucha. But we have to remember that this is food. It's a food like any other food. It's a food like yogurt is a fermented food. It's a food like broccoli is a food. It's a plant that we then eat. And so the question really is, how much of this food should you be consuming? And uh, the we always go to trust your gut. That means listen to your body, listen to the biofeedback that your body is receiving in order to decide how much kombucha you should personally be consuming. So for instance, some folks who start drinking kombucha uh, may find that they really crave it and they, they need a lot of it. And this happened to me when I first started drinking raw milk and kombucha and some other things. And what I realized was that my body had a nutritional deficiency that this food was helping to feed. And so this was part of why my body really had this intense craving for it was because it was providing a nutritional payoff to me. You know, I've been drinking kombucha now for 15 years. So um, I still drink it almost every day, but not every single day. So there can be an ebb and flow and often an ebb and flow is just good with any food, right? How much broccoli can you eat? How many bags of spinach are you able to get down in a single day? At a certain point, your body's like, all right, enough of that. Mm -hmm. um, I've gotten what I need out of that because I think we forget there's a reason we eat. And our body has so much information in its DNA that helps uh, our bodies to physiologically determine the nutrients we need that we forget. Um, also, we've been sort of programmed to look for these numbers that have been um, generated by, you know, governments wanting to provide best practices for dietary recommendations and things like that. So we've been sort of trained to look at these numbers, but I always go back to feel your body, feel your body. How does it feel when you drink the kombucha? Um, if you're running to the bathroom in 15 minutes, well, then you're clearing some stuff out, but <laughs> maybe that means you need to take it easy, increase your water consumption, and then come back to it when you're ready for, um, you know, when your body's had a chance to resettle. And so the same is true for children, right? Um, kids actually really love kombucha. Um, you know, you might think as an adult, and I've seen this so many times when I've been sampling out kombucha or 
uh, working at a kombucha booth and, and the parent is like, oh, I don't think they'll like that. And in fact, the kid ends up liking it more than the parent because the parent has more years being exposed to over sugar fried drinks yeah. than the child does. And so their palate is actually more attenuated to um, consume these flavors of health, which are sourness and bitterness. You know, those are the flavors of health and digestion. And so even if they make that little sour face, they often are, you know, give me more. Can I have some more? So kombucha is a really great substitute for any other type of beverage you might be giving your kids. But of course, you want to rotate it in with everything else as well. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of um, trust your gut. I think that's um, a lot of people think like uh, trust your gut in terms of your instincts, but trust your gut in terms of listening to your body in terms of what your body needs and what it's satisfied with and what makes it what makes it um, happy. And it's also the uh, slogan for Kombucha Camp, uh, which is your uh, awesome online uh, resource and store and all things um, kombucha. And with the virtual kombucha conference, um, when you register, you get a um, either $25 or $50 gift card to uh, Hannah's online store where you can shop everything kombucha, whether it's vessels, whether it's tea, whether it's scobies, whether it's anything you can imagine, um, it's all it's all there. So why don't we keep on scoby? Someone also from um, from Facebook. So the, the previous question was from Anna Maria. This other one was from um, um, Shyam, and um, the question. Oh, actually, this one's from Jesse. Um, so how do I control my scoby growth um, in my kombucha without? pasteurization and I mean I'm thinking of that question and I don't even know if you can control scoby go growth because it grows and it's it's live um, so that would be my answer but what are your thoughts on controlling scoby growth or is there even a purpose of or a reason to control that growth so typically for home brewers there's not uh, as much of a reason other than you don't like the texture and as we mentioned you can simply strain those out. If you're looking at producing kombucha commercially and you're concerned that this little bit of growth is going to freak them out, first of all, my experience is kombucha tends to fly off the shelf so it's not really there long enough to, to let us go be form. But um, what you need to do is somehow remove the oxygen. So um, that could be force carbonating with CO2, which is going to inject carbon dioxide into the liquid and that minimizes um, the oxygen in the bottle. Uh, another option would be to uh, use a puff of nitrogen air is sometimes used in food processing in order for preservation. And so that would be another potential technique. But like you're saying, short of pasteurization, which is how you'll, you'll stop the organisms from doing their process altogether, it's typically, um, those types of techniques. Oh, and the other one, of course, would be refrigeration. Because refrigeration is going to slow down the fermentation process, um, you're not going to find as much SCOBY growth. But you will, over time, because it doesn't stop it completely, you will, over time, potentially have them growing in there if you're leaving them in the fridge for too long. And while we're on the topic of um, fizziness and bubbles, I feel like that's one that is really elusive. I mean, some people enjoy the bubbles, some people don't enjoy the bubbles, some people want bubbles like they get in um, sparkling water or in, in pop, and then some people like this, that natural fermentation, the natural um, CO2 that happens. So there's two questions around kind of fizziness and bubbles and um, carbon dioxide. So the first is from uh, Jennifer, and she said, um, what are the benefits of using CO2 in your uh, kombucha? And it sounds like she produces it, um, I'm not sure commercially, maybe at some um, in a smaller setting, but she said she found that most of her customers don't like the carbonation. Um, so it made her curious in terms of why so many companies really have like a bubbly kombucha versus a little bit more of a flat and really light smaller bubbles. Um, and then the other question was from uh, Michelle around bubbles, which is, I'm having trouble with fizziness, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> do a second ferment um, to use whole fruits or spices, I lose the fizz. And I want to use whole organic food extracts um, or commercial juices. So how do I do the second ferment properly to get flavor and still have fizz? So I think the question is around, first of all, the role of carbon dioxide in kombucha. And then how do we 
maximize or regulate that carbonation um, from a home brewer perspective, but also um, perhaps from a, a potentially commercial um, brewer perspective. And you can shed a little bit of light on now, but I know that you'll be talking more at the virtual kombucha conference about um, scaling and growing a commercial business. So this might be of interest to those who are managing that fizziness at home and looking to um, grow and scale in the future. So what's the deal with fizziness and how do we manage the, the bubbles in our kombucha? Fizz is where it's at. You know, we could distill all of human history down to bubbles. Um, <laughs> I know. What do I mean by that? That sounds so <laughs> weird. But basically, um, yeast are this amazing um, eukaryote, just like human beings were eukaryotes. And they developed a very unique strategy for um, outcompeting other organisms, as well as ensuring their proliferation by their human stewards. And that is the creation of alcohol. So when yeast starts to ferment sugar, there are two things that happen, right? It eats the sugar and it farts out CO2, um, but then it also excretes um, uh, ethanol. Ethanol, think about it like this, right? Like uh, it's antimicrobial. So you would use rubbing alcohol on a wound to um, remove any potential bacteria from that wound as part of a cleaning process. So. Mm -hmm. Ethanol has always served this very vital function of preventing mold and other undesirable organisms from colonizing any sort of traditional fermentation um, that you might run into. Now, yeast also contain all of the B vitamins in living form. So ancient man, and in fact, the root word for yeast is yeast, which means to boil, because when ancient man, who didn't know anything about microbes at that point, um, saw the bubbles frothing on the top of their brew, that's how they knew the magic was working. And I think magic is a really great term for microbes because magic is sort of this concept of not being able to see the trick by how something's being done. And I feel like microbes are those, you know, invisible organisms that are doing all of these amazing things for our bodies and um, that we just can't see. They're invisible to us. So, um, Bubbles are where it's at, and uh, and everyone loves the bubble. Now, here's the thing. Sodas are simulacrum. So simulacrum is a word that means it's a product designed to mimic um, the characteristics of something that you might find traditionally, but then lacks typically the nutritional value. So, for example, like vegetable shortening is simulacrum for lard. It looks just like lard, but it's made from vegetables and doesn't have the same nutritional profile or health benefit to the human body as lard does. Um, and so in the case of sodas, they are really imitation fermented drinks. Mm -hmm. And so they force carbonate. They add um, uh, force carbonation. They add acids that actually deplete the body versus the organic acids that support our body from our traditional fermented drinks. And, you know, sodas were originally made in pharmacies because originally sodas were actually herbal elixirs that then were carbonated into making them like a fun, refreshing drink. And there was a little teaspoon of sugar that helped the medicine go down. Unfortunately, they've now turned into just, you know, sugary beverages that, um, you know, give you an entertainment value, but not a tr nutritional value. So the bubbles are really key here. And, and I think the thing to remember is in kombucha, we don't have carbonation. We have effervescence, which is what you were saying. These are these softer bubbles. They maybe don't prick the tongue as much as forced carbonation does, right? When you have a soda, part of how you're enjoying the sweetness of the soda is the carbonation is creating an interplay with your tongue. In traditional fermentation, it's the, um, there's a lighter effervescence to it. And so I think the reason you see some brands have more carbonation than others is likely because carbonation can be tricky because what we need is yeast plus a little bit of nutrition, and that can be in the form of sugar, such as fruit pieces or fruit juice. But that nutrition can also be ginger. Ginger actually produces quite a bit of carbonation because whatever nutrients or bacteria are present in the ginger are also um, playing really nicely with that yeast and they'll create a good bubble out of that. So you have this consumer expectation of bubbles because we've all been trained on soda for you know the last couple generations. And so people are looking for that kind of fizz, but other people prefer that lighter effervescence. And so in fact, we do see some kombucha producers who choose to have a lower fizz um, by not um, either not engaging in a secondary fermentation or leaving more of the yeast out uh, before they do their secondary fermentation because you don't get that same sort of intense bubble. 
So for everyone at home, though, who's yearning for that elusive bubble, it's, uh, it's about getting a little bit of yeast into your bottles. So when you're home brewing, um, and batch brew and continuous are slightly different. So when you're batch brewing and you see at the bottom of the jar, you have all this sort of gunk, that's your yeast. And when they're done with their job, they fall, like you can't see me in all my hand gestures, but they fall to the bottom of the jar. Yeah. And then um, and then when you go to decant, you pour everything out. Well, that pouring motion helps to move those yeast forward. Ideally, what you'd want to do is stir it up before you decant because that's going to mix the yeast a little more evenly. So then when you do pour it into your bottles, you're getting a little bit of yeast in every bottle. So now the problem with continuous brew is because we don't ever upend the vessel, it's hard to get that yeast. So again, our solution is we stir before we decant. Then when we open the spigot, a little bit of yeast is going to get into your bottle. So such that when you add a little bit of either priming sugar, a raisin, dried fruit, spices, herbs, any of those things, um, and put it in that tightly capped environment, you're going to allow for that fizz to be captured. Because remember, CO2 is a gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up on Coca-Cola. So I remember if you left the cap off that two liter, you ended up with gross, flat, <laughs> like really without the carbonation, soda is intolerable. Um, it's really the fizz that makes it even something worth drinking. But of course, these days, I don't tend to indulge in sodas as much. Because you got your kombucha. That's exactly right. I have my, my traditional fermented sodas. I have my kombucha. I have my jun. I have water kefir. You know, there's a lot of really, I mean, ginger bug, the list goes on and on. There are so many wonderful ways to get those healthy sodas back into your life that um, it sort of nullified the need to go out and buy soda. But um, from a commercial perspective, this is why you sometimes see people force carbonating because when they try to do a traditional carbonation process, it can yield inconsistent results. And so if you have a consumer expectation of like, hey, why doesn't it have the bottles I'm looking for? That can feel disappointing to them. And so then some producers will choose to force carbonate. But a lot of producers don't. And some look down on it. Some, some perceive force carbonation as, you know, a no-no. Uh, but of course, if you're putting anything in a keg, you do need a little bit of CO2 in order to get it out of the keg. Um, for example, in the EU, they have to label if carbonation is added, whereas here in the U.S. and I believe in Canada, there's no requirement for, for indicating if a product's been force carbonated. And some of you might be wondering, how do I know so much about the commercial industry? Um, uh, it, first of all, as Kombucha Camp, we are consultants to the industry. We've helped many producers, large and small, go from home brewer to commercial operation and uh, from small operation to large operation. And then in 2014, Alex and I founded Kombucha Brewers International, which is the trade association representing all commercial kombucha around the world. Um, and so I'm really grateful to be president of the trade association and to work with all kinds of brands. And of course, you are becoming an expert in commercial brands with Booch Fest, your <laughs> annual or biannual festival where you gather kombucha producers from around the world and invite home brewers to come and show off their, their favorite brews. And um, what is your next Booch Fest coming up, Drew? That's right. You're right. We, you have um, with KBI, the Kombucha Brewers International, um, the largest tasting um, of kombucha in the world, the largest tasting bar, which I'm gonna go um, visit and be a part of this April in uh, Long Beach. And I'm really excited to experience all those different brands because I just can't imagine my mind being even more expanded into the world of kombucha because yeah, Booch Fest is um, my organization that I founded with my partner, um, Samira, and um, we're the, the kombucha festival people. So we're here to celebrate um, kombucha in all aspects that we can and home brewers and really opening people's eyes, um, whether they're kombucha curious or kombucha enthusiasts or home brewers, giving them a, a place to gather, to converse, to share, to, to drink, to bring your families in, listen to groovy music and just hang out and really incorporate kombucha as part of, um, as part of your life. And um, we have a uh, the virtual kombucha conference, which is ha happening in January, and they're also having two uh, kombucha conferences or kombucha festivals, in-person ones here in uh, Canada. Um, the one is going to be our second annual in Ottawa, which is happening on July 21st. And then what's super exciting is we're moving the International Kombucha Festival from Ottawa to Montreal. And instead of having a one-day festival that we had last year, which was lots of fun, 
we're going to make it a three-day festival, have some live music, have a kombucha drinking party on Friday night with a concert, um, thousands of kombucha enthusiasts partying, drinking kombucha, having a great time, celebrating life. And then we're going to probably have anywhere from 30 to 50 different kombucha brewers from uh, all around the world coming in, sharing their kombucha, where you can come in and, and taste kombucha that's that's sweet, that's tangy, that's bubbly, that's a little bit less bubbly, um, just really mind-blowing um, kombucha experience. So if you're into kombucha, which I'm sure if you're listening today, then you have <laughs> to um, head over to uh, boochfest.ca to see all of our events. But um, the first one to learn a little bit more is yeah coming up in um, in in January. And we have a really great, I mean, obviously you're chatting. We have Sandor Katz who's coming in to um, chat about um, fermentation specifically around kombucha. And he is just an unbelievable wealth of knowledge. He could have probably talked for six to eight hours or maybe six to eight days just on fermentation and um, and kombucha. So we're super lucky to have him a part of the, the virtual kombucha conference at the end of January. Um, we also have Shabnam Weber, who is the um, co-founder and executive director of the Tea and Herbal Association of Canada. And she's going to be taking everybody through the world of tea. And I mean, we talked about bubbles, which is one part of um, kombucha, a little bit about fermentation. But when we think of the base of, um, of kombucha, we have the SCOBY, the fermentation aspect, but we also have tea. And... I can't wait to hear what Shabnan has to say about white tea, green tea, black tea, because there's, again, a lot of questions around tea. And it's such an interesting and complex ingredient that can really add um, complexity and depth to your homebrew kombucha, as well as from a commercial side of things. So I'll get a couple more questions maybe around um, tea. So first of all, there is one, the diff what's the difference from Darcy? What's the difference between kombucha, tea, and June? tea um, so that's a simple one and then secondly someone was asking about um, Kelly said that there's a big difference in terms of carbonation when she's making her tea um, in the primary fermentation so she uses jasmine tea um, which gets quite bubbly but when she uses oolong tea it's a little bit more flat so is there a difference when we're using or mixing black tea and green tea and obviously there's a whole world of tea to explore but what's the difference and what should we think of when we're using um, tea when we're when we're brewing our first batch of kombucha? Yeah, um, you are correct in that the tea will definitely impact the flavor as well as some of those other characteristics. Um, uh, you know, so tea is just a really fantastic beverage. It's been consumed worldwide for thousands of years, and it's the second most popular beverage in the world right behind water. So it goes water, tea, and then coffee. Um, but, uh, but tea is, is truly an amazing uh, drink. And in terms of the, the green tea versus the oolong, obviously each type of tea is going to have a different amount of antioxidants. It's going to have different levels of purines based on how it's processed. So green teas, and I'm sure Shabnam's going to go into this in a lot more detail, um, but green teas aren't oxidized. And by oxidized, we mean exposed to oxygen. We're in the case of tea exposed to heat in order to wither the leaves and turn them a darker color. However, that then does produce other levels of different elements. And this is where each different type of tea has a unique flavor profile and nutrient profile as well. And oftentimes what we find, although kombucha was traditionally brewed with black tea, um, is that a lot of people like to blend the green and the black. Um, you know, I've heard a variety of different things. I've experimented with a bunch of different teas. And I do notice sometimes it feels like the green teas will sour more quickly, whereas the black teas take a little bit longer to ferment. And it could be due to these differences in fermentation times as to what you're seeing in terms of the bubbles. So remember, one of the crucial ingredients to creating the bubbles is sugar. And so if you're harvesting your kombucha earlier in the process when more sugar still remains in that primary ferment, um, that can... Um, that can allow for more natural carbonation to occur in the bottle without the addition of, of you know, fruit and things like that. Uh, whereas something that has less sugar, maybe has been fermented for a longer period of time, that could be why they're seeing a little bit less fizziness. But 
you know, the, the funny thing is, and anyone who's homebrewed kombucha knows this, you can brew the exact same ingredients side by side and they can turn out totally different because our cultures are unique. And this is what makes kombucha so much fun is that uh, every, you know, culture, every batch, every, uh, everyone is going to have a different flavor profile. Now it makes it trickier for the commercial folks who want a more consistent um, product or process, but um, I really think it's those unique characteristics and, and how much fun and ingenuity we can have that brings people back. And I feel like I've sort of forgotten the first question. Did I touch on it? No, that was it. This Well, no, the first question was just what's the difference between kombucha and jun? Oh, yeah. Kombucha and jun. Okay, so um, jun, 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 um, if we're speaking Chinese here, uh, the basic difference is raw honey. So raw honey has its own host of microbes. And they also have elements that are antimicrobial. Another characteristic of honey, so, so sugar is sucrose, which is a combination of fructose and glucose into a single, it's a disaccharide, that meaning it's made up of those monosaccharide components. And so when the fermentation process starts, the first thing the yeast has to do is to break that disaccharide into the monosaccharide components. Well, honey is something that not only has sucrose, but also fructose and glucose in a free form. And so um, the fermentation is slightly faster because those elements don't need to go through that yeast fermentation before they're readily available to the bacteria themselves. So, um, so that's one of the differences. The main difference is the raw honey and how it interacts with the organism. And so, you know, some people have over time gradually fed raw honey to a kombucha scoby to turn it into a jun. Um, you know, the cultures that we work with, we didn't develop ours that way. We sourced a jun culture and, you know, we're like farmers. So we're bacteria farmers. That means when we cultivate a harvest, we're looking for certain characteristics, robustness, hardiness, good flavor, um, resistant to mold, things like that. And so then we take those cultures that have those properties and rotate them forward. So our cultures are, you know, are our own. We've grown them over many generations and um, we found that they will not they will go to mold if you give them sugar for the jun cultures and our kombucha cultures will go to mold if you feed them raw honey. So we think of them as very distinct in that regard. Um, now, we also say green tea is traditional for jun. The reality is it's been really difficult to find any historic evidence of jun. Um, so whether it's green tea or not, uh, for whatever reason, green tea and honey taste really good together. And so I think that's why that's uh, been used, but the reality is just like kombucha, we can use a wide variety of teas with our junk culture uh, for a bunch of different flavor profiles as well. And it's really neat to see it coming up as a commercial product. Wild Tonic out of Arizona um, has a jun product, and they also have a, a higher alcohol jun in the marketplace. And then we're also seeing some smaller brands like Soma in Portland and um, Honey, Honey June out of uh, Washington. So we're seeing it kind of come up in a bunch of different places, which is exciting. Mm -hmm. um, a couple other questions from, from Facebook around home brewing. And um, I, we, we, you kind of touched on it before about um, when you're thinking of the carbonation process and the, the ferment or the fermentation process in terms of the factors that accelerate or decelerate that, um, that process. And you also mentioned that when you're home brewing, again, when we're talking about a live um, culture and a live drink, that it's really hard to be very, very consistent, even if you follow the same recipe in the same time. And I, I, I think of it when I'm when I'm cooking. I'm a, um, I love cooking at home. Um, I love once in a while baking at home. But what you find is that depending on the season, you have different ingredients, depending on the weather, it could be humid, it could be cold, it could be warm. So all these things, the environmental factors come into, come into effect when you are brewing your own um, kombucha. So I'm sure you'll chat about this in, in your session at the um, virtual kombucha conference around the key factors to um, perfecting and making your own home brew. But let me give you a couple of questions um, from some home brewers on Facebook. So Mark asked, he said, in my last few batches, I find my booch isn't as carbonated as usual after the second fermentation. In the past, it would take sometimes uh, five plus minutes to open the bottle without pouring it all over the place. And I'm sure some home brewers have experienced that. We open it, open it, just keeps pouring over the uh, kombucha volcano. Um, but then he says, now I open a bottle and it barely even 
um, makes a noise. I haven't really been doing anything different. Maybe my house is cooler in the winter. Could that affect the carbonation? And the other question was from uh, Ruthie asking, why is my kombucha so sour tasting now? The last several months isn't just the same. Um, and I said, I asked if she had changed the recipe or the way that she had been uh, making her kombucha. And she said, nope, just remove the extra scobies, but pretty much the same way that she's been making it. So how does the environment at home affect all your all the kombuchas? And why would they change? What I was yeah, so what I was trying to show people, I don't know if, how clearly it came through, was um, I have a heater. I'm in Southern California, and I know we talked about temperature when we first got on here. Um, and even I have a heater on my kombucha year-round simply because the kitchen's the coldest room in my house. I have granite countertops. So each person's environment is going to vary, and that environment – is going to have an impact on how the brew ferments and then the changing of the season. So it isn't simply a temperature related issue. There's also humidity as well as a couple other environmental factors that can impact um, how the brew changes from season to season. And so as much as we can, we try to control for those factors by using heating elements. So for kombucha, our ideal temperature range is 75 to 85 degrees with 80 being our sweet spot. It's kind of warm and toasty. And most people aren't necessarily keeping their homes at that temperature year round. Now, it isn't to say that we can't ferment at cooler temperatures, and certainly many people do. However, the trade-off there is usually you have to wait longer for the fermentation to complete. Sometimes the flavors aren't as developed because the fermentation is moving more slowly. And it can even happen if it's cold enough or the starter liquid's too weak that you can end up with mold. So the way that we combat all of those issues year round is to use a heating system that keeps it in those ideal temperature ranges as closely as we can. Um, another factor, because we don't have all the details of their process, is about where we're taking our starter liquid. So while it is important that we have the yeast in order to create fizz, if you're doing a batch brew process and you drain everything down to the bottom and just use what's at the bottom of the vessel for your starter liquid, you'll quickly throw the balance between the bacteria and yeast out. And when that happens, um, you'll end up with souring, off flavors, and, it, and weak SCOBY growth, and it really will mess up the whole balance of everything. And so making sure that you're always taking that starter liquid from the top is really key to ensure, excuse me, kombucha burps, um, is really key the only time you can burp on camera and it's okay because <laughs> I've been drinking kombucha. Um, <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's part of what's going on is you want to make sure you're taking your starter from the right place because even though there's a symbiosis, we are the stewards of the balance. And so if we're not engaging in the best practices for that, that's what can throw the brew off and, and it can lead to some of these carbonation challenges. And the carbonation challenges and the flavor challenges and all those don't end with your first batch when it's successful. So um, I would definitely encourage home brewers who don't have 15 years experience like uh, Hannah does. I probably have, let's say, two years of home brewing experience and I've got a few bottles and Scobie hotels and that sort of thing behind me. But um, when I'm asked, like when people say, OK, well, how do I get started with kombucha? How do I make my first one? And when I started my kind of kombucha journey, I was I was kind of taken aback at how simple and easy it was. And I would almost say that most households have the ingredients um, other than a scoby to brew your own kombucha. Most people have a jar. They have probably tea or they have a neighbor that has some tea. They have some <laughs> water. They have sugar. So the only thing you have to do is either make your own SCOBY or call a friend or go on Facebook and ask a, a, a neighbor to, to give you a SCOBY and to be able to just get in and, and start. And I know um, in your book, the big book of um, kombucha, when, when, when people ask and you kind of address this in there of, okay, how do I know if my kombucha is ready? How do I know if it's sweet enough or sour enough or bubbly enough? Well, it's just about the experimentation and also about tasting it. And don't be afraid of just, like you just showed, put it on your tongue. It's your most sensitive um, 
tasting organ. And, uh, you know, your tongue is really, the reason we have all these taste buds is because we need to detect the nutrients present in our food. Now, again, this problem goes back to there's so much sugar in our food supply that our tongues end up getting coated or our pH shifts a little bit. And we start to crave foods that maybe don't have our best nutrients in mind, um, but are more driven by taste and flavor. And food producers know this. And this is why they create beverages um, and include addictive chemicals in order to get you to buy foods that don't have a nutritional payoff. Um, and what's great about consuming beverages like kombucha or even including any fermented foods in your diet is you're going to start to see it shift back to that other palate. And what happens is, is foods have a renewed, delicious flavor when you start to rebalance the body and come back, you know, leave the dark side. Look, I sugar is still something we use to make kombucha. So I don't demonize sugar. It's just, you know, in what quantities, how is it processed? And what type of sugar, right? There's a lot of chemical fake sugars out there that are really harmful for the body. And while they don't have calories, they still have so many negative impacts that I'd rather get the calories from my sugar and use the real thing than um, substitute with something that that isn't isn't going to be good for me long term. But um, you know, it's it's a fun, tricky, creative process. Your body, you know, human beings have been doing this for hundreds, maybe thousands of years people wonder, is it safe? Well, my answer is it couldn't exist this long. It couldn't have such a vaunted reputation if it truly was something that was so dangerous or so hard to take care of. And, you know, that low pH, being an acetic acid ferment like vinegar, that tanginess is really sour power. It's, it's the healthy acids that keep your body healthy. And it's also the acids that compete with microorganisms to prevent mold and things like that. So, you know, starting with kombucha is really easy. And of course, if you don't have a trusted source, that's who we are kombucha camp we're your trusted source we're in an inspected facility we use all organic ingredients so um and our cultures are guaranteed so if you can't find that friend or you question how they've been making their kombucha then uh, we do ship all over the world so we're always happy to help you out with any supplies that you might need um to have brewing success um, well, this has been really fun, Drew. I love answering all these questions. And I know we're going to do a live Q&A with Sandor on the last day of the event. Mm -hmm. So hopefully everybody who's watching today is uh, rushing out to grab their tickets, getting their uh, gift certificate to Kombucha Camp, and is ready to see these really tremendous presentations we have lined up for them in the virtual Kombucha Conference. Yeah, I can't wait. I mean, if this is just the the little the teaser, the, the tip of the iceberg, um, day one of fermentation, if you will, it's going to be even more effervescent um, at the end of at the end of January. So I'm I'm super pumped too, and I appreciate your appreciate your time. I know you're busy um, working at uh, Kombucha Camp and and supplying high quality kombucha products as well as supplies to um, to the world. Um, it's kombuchacamp.com, and when you do get a ticket for the virtual kombucha conference, um, you get a twenty five dollar or fifty dollar gift card that you can go and pick up your uh, kombucha supplies for before the uh, before the conference. And we're also um, donating $5 for every ticket to Kombucha Brewers International, which you mentioned you were one of the, um, the co-founders um, of, which is the voice of the kombucha industry um, of the world. So we're super excited to kind of really have a deep dive into kombucha, having you a part of it and being the keynote uh, speaker and um, co-organizer of the Virtual Kombucha Conference. So um, as Hannah said, head over to virtualkombuchaconference.com, grab your tickets, and you'll learn so much more, and you're going to make some perfect kombucha. And who knows, you might be the next GT's kombucha as a result of, of joining the conference. So um, looking forward to seeing you there. Thanks again, Hannah. And um, we'll chat again at the end of January. All right. Thanks so much, Drew. Thanks, everybody. Happy brewing. Happy brew year. Happy brew year. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>